Repentance is the word that we're talking about today. It's very, very interesting because what does that word actually mean? Well, we're talking from Hosea 14, 1 through 9. It is a good day to read the Bible. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. We are discovering the Bible and learning from Hosea some of the things that God has spoken to us. Now, Corey and Ryan are here as well. Corey? Today, I'm going to be taking a look at one of the kings who reigned during Hosea's ministry, Ahaz. Ryan? Well, I know that we're in Hosea, but today I want to go back a little bit and show you an exciting archaeological discovery related to Daniel. Daniel is amazing, so that's good. Okay, Janice, what are you doing? Today, my segment's called The Foundation Stone. All right, so get out your Bible guide. If you don't have one, stay there. We'll tell you how you can get one in a moment. And turn to Hosea 14, and let's listen in the Bible to what God has said to us. Hosea 14, 1 through 9. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifice of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods. For in you the fatherless finds mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Hosea chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. You know, the word is interesting. It's a word called repentance. What does that actually mean? Some people think it's a a religious word that sounds very, uh, well, this is the way you do things. But living in a way that pleases God is how Christians desire to be. And that's what repentance is about. We dedicate our lives to God to learning and following his ways over our own. There are understandably then many difficulties to be faced in the Christian life in this world, including our own countries actually. Many of the nations that we live in now do not nor have ever chosen to follow God. And the persecution of Christians has never been higher. Entire cultures have turned desires against what the word of God tells us life is all about. Well, in the West, we make it all about human rights. Everything's about my rights, my rights, individual rights. But as Christians or Christ followers, we should be less interested in our rights and more interested in doing the right thing according to God. Some things never change, though, and our way to God is an example of this. It has been through repentance. Repentance is the first step to following God. Today we read Hosea 14, and we learn the benefits of repentance to our merciful and kind creator. Now, this world that we live in is not a world where sin is taken care of. In fact, the world is under the bondage of sin because of the first couple, Adam and Eve, I believe they were literal, and they, were, they came on the earth and they did opposite of what God told them. You know, God told them, I want you not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they ate of the tree. They did exactly what God told them not to do. 
Very, very interesting. Well, today, as we focus on Hosea 14, we're going to study that. So take your Bible guide out and turn with me to that page. If you don't have a Bible guide, write to us or call us. We'll send you one. And also remember that you can get a hold of it on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you go there, click on the Bible guide and it will take you to a page where you can download it exactly how we've printed it. So you can have your copy of the Bible guide and thank you for your donation. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to hear your word and to listen to what you're telling us and saying to us, especially today, right now. Holy Spirit, teach us your way and show us your path. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen and amen. With that in mind, let's open our hearts and listen to the first scripture here in Hosea chapter 14. It says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away our iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. For in you, the fatherless finds mercy. In you, the fatherless finds mercy. Now, here's the first point that I see here. When we know that God is the only one who can forgive us, we are ready to come to Jesus Christ. Now, that's important to remember. There is only one way to total forgiveness, complete forgiveness and heaven. And that beloved is through Jesus Christ. Many people have tried to say, well, if you do this or do that or give to this ministry or give that ministry, give to this church, give to that church, you'll be forgiven. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ as Lord, believe in your heart, he died and rose again. And then you say, Lord, be the Lord of my life. Then you will discover the truth about who God is and learn how to live a repentant life. All right. Now let's go on to the next scripture because it's very interesting. Verse four says, I will heal their backsliding. There it is. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return, Hosea says. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Now, the second point is very interesting. Listen carefully. God not only forgives us for our sins, beloved, but he builds our strength. He builds our life. You see, the great redemption is that God makes us better than we ever were or ever could be simply because when we come to him, he reinforces the things which he made in us, which has been tarnished by sin. God relieves that burden and the Holy Spirit comes in. It is a fascinating way to think. And that's how God tells us it goes. Now, it's really important to understand this because the last two verses tell us something interesting. The third point comes this way. The eighth verse of the chapter. Ephraim shall say... What have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them but transgressor, transgressors stumble in them. Now notice that, okay? The third point is very, very important. There is a big difference between living for Jesus Christ and living 
for yourself. There's a big difference between living for Jesus Christ and living for yourself. There is only one way to free yourself from the weight and the burden of sin, and that is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. It's really very simple. And as you do that and come to Jesus Christ, you begin to understand it's not an 800 number you have to call or a big offering you have to give or something you have to sign a document to. None of that. It's your heart. It's coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I believe in you. I need you. Help me, Lord, as we've read Hosea. I, I sense this in my spirit. And help me, Lord. I, I don't even know what to say to you except forgive me of my sin. Be the Lord of my life. You, you died on the cross 2,000 years ago and you rose from the dead. So help me, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I repent and I say, Father, come into my life and be the Lord of my life. In your name, amen. Now, if you say that and you're serious and you pray about it, the first thing you do is not call an 800 number or not give an offering or do anything is get a hold of a Bible and start to read with us. Let's read the word of God together. We're, we're in the process of reading through the Bible. We do it every year and join us as we read the word of God. Then God will speak to you everything that you do after that. All right, well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And our reading today is Hosea chapters 12 to 14. But as I said earlier, today I want to go back a book to Daniel because I want to share with you some really cool archaeological discoveries related to it. And specifically to Daniel chapter 5, which is the famous writing on the wall passage. And while unbelievers will often dismiss this story as a mere fairy tale, the truth is secular history corroborates it. And over the next two days, I'm going to be documenting some of the artifacts that archaeologists have found. And first up is an artifact known as the Cylinder of Nabonidus. Take a look. Daniel 5 is undoubtedly one of the most memorable chapters, not only of the Old Testament, but in the entire Bible, as it tells the story of the last of the Babylonian kings, Belshazzar, who held a very large feast and irreverently used the gold and silver vessels acquired from God's temple in Jerusalem as wine vessels for he and his guests, all the while praising the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. But God would not be mocked. Because as the Bible says, immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Of course, this utterly terrified Belshazzar and he called all the wise men of Babylon, promising great rewards to whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation. But none of these so-called wise men could even read, let alone interpret the writing. Only God's prophet Daniel could. And after reading the words aloud, Daniel gave the interpretation. God has numbered the days of your kingdom, O king, and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Furthermore, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And so it was that very night Belshazzar the king was killed and Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Now, although this story is clearly written in historical narrative without extra biblical corroboration, unbelievers doing what they do best automatically dismiss it as fictional, especially when the person or persons involved are not known to secular history. Of course, several biblical figures once thought to be fictional have turned up in secular records. King David is a good example of this. And this is precisely what happened with Belshazzar, because in 1854, a Babylonian text was discovered containing his name. As professional archaeologist Dr. Titus Kennedy explains, in about 550 BC, Nabonidus, king of Babylon, had placed four identical cylinders as foundation deposits at a temple in Ur of southern Mesopotamia. 
Recovered in excavations at the Temple of the Moon God Sin in Ur, this cylinder of Nabonidus, King of Babylon, contains a 62-line cuneiform inscription in two columns. Part of the text recorded an appeal to the moon god Sin and stated that, For me, Nabonidus, King of Babylon, save me from sinning against your great godhead and grant me as a present a life long of days. And as for Belshazzar, my firstborn son, my own child, let the fear of your great divinity be in his heart, and may he commit no sin. May he enjoy happiness in life. While the Nabonidus cylinder from Ur primarily focuses on repairs made to a ziggurat for the moon god, the document also specifies that the eldest son of the Babylonian king Nabonidus was named Belshazzar. So this discovery shows that Belshazzar was not only a real person, but was exactly who the Bible says he was. Hence, archaeology continues to affirm that the writing indeed was on the wall. So even though unbelievers doubted that Belshazzar was a real person, the cylinder of Nabonidus put that idea to rest. King Belshazzar was indeed a real person in history. And not only that, but he was also exactly who the Bible says he was. And as I said earlier, there's more, but we're going to have to wait on that until tomorrow. More. So we're going to look for more. So that's going to be yeah. very interesting. Uh, these discoveries are fascinating, aren't they? They're yeah. amazing. Oh, they really are. I mean, it's incredible. The more that we dig, the more archaeologists dig into the ground, as Corey, will, uh, as Corey often says, they, the more that they find. Well, because Israel is an ancient culture, an ancient society, like many of them over there. And uh, it's, it's different here. You know, you build a development area, you just go and tear up the land and develop it and put all the pipes in. But there, I was in Israel and they told me that they have to get clearance because everywhere they dig, it's, mm -hmm. there's, there's, they're going to run into a... Yeah, a lot of times they, they stop, they have to stop pretty much right away and yeah. call in the authorities. Because it's restricted and they have to get the IAA to come in and all that. Preserve so, the history. Yeah. yeah. And that has an effect when war comes in and they start using bombs and that sort of thing too. So yeah. that's very, very interesting. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Corey? All right, well, today we're talking about biblical King Ahaz because Hosea 1 tells us that Hosea ministered in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So, biblical King Ahaz, he lived in the 8th century BC, and he ruled over Judah from its capital city of Jerusalem. Now, the Bible records that his 16-year reign was a blemish of apostasy wedged between the godly reigns of his father, King Jotham, and his son, King Hezekiah. Ahaz built idols, he sacrificed at the pagan high places that were splashed around his country, and he even sacrificed his own children in the Valley of Hinnom, which is just outside of Jerusalem. But practically speaking, Ahaz lived in a very difficult time politically and physically. The Assyrian Empire was on the move, defeating countries and growing in strength and power. Now, this Assyrian threat forced other nations into action. So they were forming alliances and attempting to secure more money and military strength before having to face the Assyrian troops that were inevitably coming. We're told that Syria, AKA Aram, inflicted major military losses on Judah. The nation of Israel also inflicted major losses on Judah, including killing Ahaz's son, Messiah, who was likely the crown prince at the time. And Israel took 200,000 Judean captives before ultimately returning them after the controversy of enslaving their relatives threatened an internal revolt. But we're also told that on Ahaz's southern borders, Edom had been attacking, taking territory and carrying away captives. And the Philistines on the western border of Judah had been conducting regular raids into Judah's territory, slowly absorbing, absorbing Judah's cities into their own. It was really bad. And this is when the prophet Isaiah had encouraged King Ahaz to trust God, and God promised in return to save the country if he would. But instead, Ahaz sent word to Assyria's king Tiglath-Pileser, pledging Judah's allegiance if Assyria would rescue him. Assyria did come and defeat Ahaz's enemies but Ahaz's hopes for a peaceful allegiance came to naught. The Bible records that Assyria hassled Judah, demanding more and more payments and taking what she wanted. 
Rather than turn Ahaz to God, though, the Bible tells us that King Ahaz doubled down on his religious apostasy. He traveled to the defeated country of Aram, Syria, and recreated that city's pagan altar back in Jerusalem. He shut the Jerusalem temple and cut up the temple articles, probably to be melted and reused in the creation of idols and new altars, which we're told he had set up in every corner of the city. Jerusalem wasn't enough though. We're also told that Ahaz commissioned high places to be built in every city of Judah so that the people could freely worship other gods. Now, interestingly though, a lot of Ahaz's biblical fame is ideological. There is still archeological evidence that goes hand in hand with the Bible's claims here. Not only have signet seals been found providing evidence for his existence as a king of Judah in the eighth century, but there's also an Assyrian record recording the lavish tribute he had to pay to Tiglath-Pileser, as well as evidence of pagan altars that were systematically destroyed soon after their establishment, matching really well with the Bible's assertion that the very next king, King Hezekiah, radically reversed Ahaz's apostasy and decommissioned all of his high places. Now, I'm gonna give you more on all of those archeological finds in the next segment on tomorrow's program. Oh, that's very interesting, Corey, and this sort of push and then push back and all of that is really fascinating because in the wake of Messiah later on and Ammon, we have Josiah, which or Manasseh and, and Ammon, we have Josiah, which mm -hmm. is really, really interesting yeah. because there's a kickback there. That is fascinating. Thank you so much for yeah. that. Janice? Today, looking at Hosea chapter 14, Rod taught on verses one through nine, and I called my segment, The Foundation Stone. I like what the Holman's Study Bible says about the book of Hosea and about Hosea the man. Listen to this. Hosea's divinely commissioned marriage to the promiscuous Gomer, which brought Hosea such heartache, seems to have been the beginning of his long career. But rather than ministering in spite of personal sorrow, his troublesome marriage was the foundation stone of his ministry. Now we see in this particular chapter that that um, Israel is restored at last, and, and God even gives his people a sinner's prayer in the first three verses. We find out that then he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. You know, God calls out to us the same today. He calls us back to repentance, to be uh, restored to him through Jesus Christ. God promises restoration to Israel in verses five through seven, life and beauty as to a dead abandoned garden. And God does the same. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in repentance to turn away from our sin and give our lives to follow him, our deadness in sin turns to new life in Christ Jesus. He restores us to new life, this eternal life, this gift of eternal life through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what God calls us to. And he is our foundation stone. I marked in, let's see here, 1 Peter chapter two, and I do have time to read it. 1 Peter two verses four through 10. It talks about the chosen stone and his people coming to him Christ, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 
who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This whole calling of God to repent, to come back, to be restored, is the same thing that's offered to us today, Rod. And I just thank God for his merciful and amazing grace. That grace that extends to us forgiveness of sins that we don't deserve. Absolutely. I I think it's interesting because a lot of people would say, uh, if God is so big and real, then how come there's evil in the world? And we, we don't really understand, based on what you're saying, we don't really understand God and sin has tarnished us and created these problems that we have. Every difficulty in the world is literally created by selfish sin. Jesus Christ, through his mercy, Jesus Christ, through his desire, came into the world and lived. And then he gave his life. We, all of us, were involved in that murder. But he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he said, go tell the people what I've done for you. So if we invite Jesus Christ into our heart to be Lord of our life, he will come in and his spirit will come with him and he will regenerate us. And then we can't change without the spirit of God. But with the Holy Spirit, we can change. So you can change if the Holy Spirit is in you. Today we pray, Lord, I repent of my sin. I believe that you came and gave your life and rose from the dead in the flesh. Help me today to follow you. Help me to be yours in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, I continue to pray for the people who support us and help us through giving. Help them and touch them, Lord, today. May you be able to, through them, they allow you to pay their bills and do everything necessary to meet all of their needs.